Real change starts by getting real. And then real change continues when the god of change shows up. Please have a seat. And uh, if you've closed up your Bible, why don't you open it up again to uh, page 808, or it's also uh, printed in your service order, Matthew chapter 3, the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, his big launch event, the baptism. And as we get Matthew chapter 3 open in front of us, let me say a, a prayer that I would be clear and that we would hear what God has to say to each one of us. Let's pray. Father God, we have your word open in front of us, and so we ask you now to speak. We ask you, please, to talk to each one of us in the depths of our hearts. Please show us, Jesus, that in his face we might know what you are truly like, and we might, not, we might know what we are truly like. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're thinking this evening about real change, real change. And our story from Matthew chapter 3 tells us that real change happens when you get real. Real change happens from a place of honesty. Did you notice as this chapter was read, there are a whole bunch of people who are showing up to the failures convention. That's what the baptism is at the Jordan River. It's the failures convention. can't imagine that such a convention would be very popular these days if you put signs outside of JPC saying, Losers Convention, come one, come all, you must be a loser. Um, Well, that's kind of what church is. I don't know if you know this, but uh, here we are, 6.30 p.m. Sunday. It's, uh, It's the Failures Convention. That's what you've shown up to. That's what the Christian life is. Because if you're a Christian, then you are someone who is baptized. And a church is the community of the baptized. A baptism, you might know, is uh, it's just a word that means a washing. And this baptism here at the Jordan River is a ritual washing that points to an internal cleansing that you and I all need. We all need the kind of bath that Matthew chapter 3 talks about. Do you know that about yourself? Do you know that you need cleansing? Do you know that you need a power shower on the inside? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't you long for that, a power shower on the inside? That's what these people come to have. In verse 5, it says, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to John the Baptist, and they were baptized by him, washed by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Here are a bunch of people getting real, because that's where real change begins. It begins with... Authenticity begins with openness, begins with honesty. You know, we're, we're very prone to be honest about the world that is out there. We're very prone to say, ah, the world is not the way it should be. Dear, dear, the world out there is wrong, and we point the finger. But of course, as the old saying goes, if you point the finger at somebody else, you've got three fingers pointing right back at you. And these people are getting real to the, the extent that they're saying, look, there's darkness out in the world. Of course there's darkness out in, in the world. But there's also darkness in here. There's darkness in my heart. And that somehow the, the darkness out there and the darkness in here is linked Somehow the world is not the way it should be because I am not the way I should be. And they're taking responsibility for it. They come to John the Baptist confessing their sins. They're saying, I'm unclean. Do you know that about yourself? Have you ever wanted a power shower on the inside? I've wanted that many, many times. A friend of mine counsels people for a living, and uh, he was once dealing with a guy who'd made some terrible decisions that had cost him his marriage, cost him his family, cost him his business. And this man said to my friend, I just wish I could take my whole life, bundle it up in a big washing machine, and put it on the hottest wash possible until all the grit and the grime is gone. Have you ever wanted that? These people want that. So they confess to being 
unclean. They also confess to being unfruitful. Perhaps you noticed that language as it was being read in verse 8. John speaks of bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. And you think, well, what am I, a tree? Am I a tree that I should bear fruit? Well, apparently. That's the way the Bible speaks about the human race. We're meant to be like trees, but we are fruitless trees. Or we are trees that produce bad fruit, and out it comes. And so John says in verse 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. It's almost like a riddle throughout the Old Testament, this sort of idea of a fruitless vine. Israel, God's people, were a fruitless vine. And again and again, the Old Testament prophets sort of say, what's, what's the point of a fruitless vine? If, if, you, if you have a, a vine that is not producing grapes, what's the point of it? I mean, you can't turn it into furniture. It's, it's not good for anything except firewood. A fruitless vine is a useless thing, and fruitless people, oh well, my goodness, we, we are disconnected from our life source. We are fruitless and we are headed for the compost heap. This is the message of John the Baptist. The human race are a lot like a Christmas tree. Think about a Christmas tree. In November, there will be a, a woodsman who will go into the, the pine forest, and uh, what will he do? In, in the name of Christmas joy, this woodsman will chop down some poor pine tree that's flourishing and verdant and doing just, just, just fine, thank you very much, but in the name of Christmas joy, we're going to hack it to death, we're going to wrench it from its natural habitat, and we will bring it indoors. And uh, what will we do with this Christmas tree? Well, we're going to dress it up, aren't we? Even though it's dead, even though it's perishing, we're going to put tinsel all over it and bling and baubles and all sorts of things. Decorate the Christmas tree. We're going to surround it with family and food and festivities. We're going to celebrate around this Christmas tree. And, and yet, the tree is dead and it's perishing. And the needles will start to drop, and you think, oh, never mind, I'll just hoover those up. And then a bit of brown starts to show on the Christmas tree, and you think, oh, I'll just move the tinsel over it, no, fine, uh, no problem at all, we'll just keep on celebrating. More family, more food, more festivities, more perishing, more death. And at some point in January, you just chuck it out, don't you? Or the illustration here is you, you, you chuck it onto the bonfire. That, that kind of humanity, it is lifeless. It is perishing. It has no future. And John here speaks in the most serious of terms. Here he speaks of this reality as fire. Sometimes Jesus speaks of it as an outer darkness. Sometimes he speaks of it as being shut out of the feast. Sometimes the Bible speaks of it like being lost at sea, abandoned to the surging waves. The Bible describes this reality in many different ways, but really it's a, it's a perishing. It's a it's a disconnection from our life source. And the Bible says you don't want to get stuck in disconnection, do you? You don't want to continue perishing forever, do you? Because the Bible says we all go on forever. But will we go on in connection with our life source? Or will we go on in disconnection? from our life source? That's the big question for all of us. And John lays it in front of us, this, this dreaded reality of, of judgment. Because the world out there might be dark, yes. The world out there might need setting to rights, yes. The world out there might need judgment, yes. But so do you. I need judgment too. I deserve judgment. Are you aware that the darkness out there is mirrored in the darkness in here. Let me give you two examples of it. One's a silly example, one's a very serious example. But the silly example is this. I was uh, preaching at a church in Eastbourne where I live, and it's not my usual church that I go to. The musicians in this church that I went to uh, were very different from JPC uh, musicians. They, they, were, they were keen. Uh, they tried hard, uh, perhaps too hard at times. And uh, as the singing progressed, I was getting more and more uncomfortable with this discordant note. And in particular, there was, there was this one male singer who was singing, and I, and I just thought, I, I can't handle this. And I, I tried my hand at telepathy. Do you ever do that? You, you ever try to send a message to the guy on the PA desk? And my message went like this, turn him down. 
and I meant this literally, for the love of God, turn him down. And it just got worse, hymn after hymn, song after song, until after my sermon, I sort of sat down, and this, this singing just went on. And I, I, I sort of turned around to, to, you know, look at the PA desk guy, and, and he sort of did that. And, but there was something in the back of my head that, that just didn't sit right, and I, I just had this tremendous sense that I, I should have looked down at that point. And, and, and all of a sudden, I, I decided, as we were singing this hymn, to, to look down at, at, at my lapel mic that was just there, and my battery pack that, oh, yep, sure enough, it's on. And I realized that the discordant voice was mine. I was so worried about the cacophony out there, I was the one causing the cacophony, right? And isn't this what we are like? We look out at a world and we, dis we hear discordant voices and we say, it's cacophonous, it's horrendous, somebody should do something. Yeah, it's you, right? <laughs> Don't point the finger out there, look down. <laughs> look within, look at the heart and you'll see. The world out there that needs putting right. Well, that's because you need putting right. I need putting right. That's the, that's the silly example. The serious example is I was uh, in Poland a few years ago and a friend of mine said, well, let's go and visit Auschwitz, shall we? And it was uh, the most harrowing day I, I've ever spent, I think, going through that horrendous death camp. And I think the worst, the worst place was a room that was called the exploitation of the corpses. And in this room, you couldn't take photographs because it contained human remains, hair. The Nazis wanted to eke out every last penny from their victims, and so they would shave the heads of their victims and sell on the hair for a few pennies. This room was full of hair and spectacles, so many spectacles, so many shoes, so many briefcases, so much wanton evil. And it was just this, this sense of this, this conveyor belt of evil, just so efficient, so horrendous. And as I toured around this room, there were, there were two phrases that I kept wanting to say. In fact, these two phrases were, were, were so pressing on me, I had to vocalize them. I had to whisper them under my breath, these two phrases. And the first one was a mild swear word. I won't, I won't say what I really said, but thinking of the Nazi evil, I just kept on thinking, you bees, you bees, you total bear. And if you were there and if you saw what they did, you, you would be thinking the exact same thing. You would point the finger at that evil. And yet, hot on the heels of that phrase, I, I kept on saying another phrase. Another phrase just kept on springing up from my heart, unbidden. I couldn't stop it. I kept on saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And you think, well, why am I sorry? What, what am I doing here? Why, why do I feel a connection to this evil? Why am I apologizing for something that happened decades before I was even born? What, why? Well, you know what? There's a darkness out there and there's a darkness in here and you and I know that that's linked somehow. I can't tell you how, really. But there is a connection. And for all that we look out at a hellish world, well, you look within and you see a hellish heart. And John the Baptist is crying out, saying, get real. Will you get real? You don't want to get stuck in that darkness, do you? Won't you get real? Won't you come to the failures convention and put up your hand and say, yeah, me too, I need a bath too, I need real change? That's where it starts. Real change starts by getting real. And then real change continues when the God of change shows up. That's what happens in verse 13. It's so striking. With all that background in mind, with the fiery preaching of John the Baptist in mind, now read verse 13. Then Jesus came. Then the, the perfect, pure Son of God came. You know the name Jesus means Savior. Then the Savior from heaven came from Galilee, where he, was, uh, where he grew up, to the Jordan, to John, to... Oh, that's interesting. You see how the verse finishes? He came to the Jordan, to John, to... How should that verse end? If you've been following the verse along, you would think 
the verse ends, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to judge all those nasty sinners, right? Isn't, isn't that what you're expecting? So it's kind of what John's been expecting. He's kind of saying, the judge is coming. The judge is coming, the judge is coming, the judge is coming. And then verse 13 says, the judge comes. And he comes to the Jordan to, not to judge them. Or how else should that verse go on? Perhaps it should say, Jesus came to the Jordan to John to baptize everyone else. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be a lovely little scene, wouldn't it? I can kind of imagine the scene. Jesus kind of holding them in his arms and kind of washing them and say, there, there, let me give you a bath. You say you're unclean, let me wash you. Wouldn't that be a lovely scene? That would be a lovely scene, wouldn't it? It's not what this says. Do you see how shocking this is? Verse 13, it's so shocking. Jesus came to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Do you see where this is a shocking verse? You're almost thinking this shouldn't be in here. This, is, this has been mistranslated or something. This, that's what you're thinking, aren't you? Jesus takes a bath alongside all the other filthy sinners. Really? You know what this is? This is a public relations disaster for Team Jesus, isn't it? If you're in the marketing department of Team Jesus, like, wouldn't you you'd be going ballistic at this point? You're like, Jesus, no, the optics are bad. Okay, pull back. We don't... This looks really bad, because what does it look like? He's just joined the queue with all the other sinners at the Failures Convention, and he dives into the water alongside all the other messy people. What does it look like? Looks like he's a sinner, but he doesn't care. He dives in the water anyway. Isn't that stunning? I'm always stunned by that, especially because here is Jesus. He's perfect, he's pure, he doesn't mind being mistaken for a sinner. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't mind being mistaken as a sinner. He's, he's, not, he's not just trying to fool people. It's not about a front with him. He's perfect, he's pure, and he doesn't mind if people think he's a sinner. Wow. Because I am a sinner, and I do whatever I can not to appear like one, right? That's my entire life. Even though I'm a total dreadful, dirty, filthy sinner. And I spend my whole time trying to appear righteous before people. Jesus, the one person who's actually righteous, he doesn't care. He, just, he joins with the filthy failures at the loser's convention. Don't you just love Jesus? If you know who he is, he is the prince of heaven. He is, as we'll see in verses 16 and 17, he is the one filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is the beloved of the Father, the Son of the Emperor of the cosmos, the Lord Most High, comes to planet Earth and he joins the Failures Convention. He cuts to the front of the queue and he gets baptized too. What's he doing? Well, it's, it's about solidarity, isn't it? You know what he's doing? It's... It's a bit like a, a, a footballer starting the new season, you know. Imagine, imagine a new footballer who gets brought into your team that's heading for relegation. I don't know if you know any teams that are heading for relegation this season. I, maybe you've read about some. But um, <laughs> I was on the train on the way up here, and there were, there were lots of people who joined at York who had come across from, from Manchester last night. They were, they were worse for wear. They really were. <laughs> I really felt for those guys. But maybe you know a team that's heading for relegation. I don't know. But imagine, imagine the new player enters into your team, right? This incredible teenager from, who knows, from South America. And he's just, you know, you've paid squillions of pounds for him. And, and, and what do you do at that point? As the new player enters the team, you know, they, they put on the kit of, of the new team, don't they? And they have the big, the big press conference and the photo call and they shake hands with the manager and they wear the kit and they're basically saying, look, from, from now on, everything I do, I do for you, right? Every goal I score from now on, I score for your team. Every victory is now your victory because I'm one with you, because I'm your champion, right? And what do we see here? with the baptism. Here comes the Prince of Heaven, and we are a member of Team Earth, and we are definitely heading for relegation. That's what verses 1 to 12 have been about. We're definitely heading for relegation. But here comes this, this wonderkind, right? Come, comes into our 
team. And at the baptism, it's, it's like the, the press conference. It's like he's shaking hands with the manager up in heaven. And he is joining us in our predicament as our champion to be one with us, to do it for us. It's beautiful, really. Back in Isaiah, 700 years earlier, it was predicted that when the Messiah came, he would be numbered alongside the transgressors. That's what the verse said in, Matthew, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 53. He would be numbered among the transgressors, counted alongside all the other failures like you and me. He'd be the champion who wears the colors of Team Earth and to do it for us. So here is Jesus joining us at the Failures Convention. John doesn't quite get it yet. Verse 14, John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. See, John is saying what you and I would say. We, we would say, Jesus, we shouldn't wash you. You need to wash us. And you know, essentially, Jesus answers him and says, You know what? I'm going to join you in your failure so you can join me in my family. That's the story of the Bible in a sentence. Do you know the story of the Bible in a sentence? The Son of God says, I join you in your failure so you can join me in my family. That's what Matthew's Gospel is all about. Jesus, our champion, joins us in our failure, wears the colors of Team Earth, and then if you read on in Matthew's Gospel, he, he starts taking on all the enemies that get the better of you in life. You know why you fail to change? You know why you make every New Year's resolution and it, and it lasts about 15 days? Do, do you know why? We're no good at change. We're no good at doing it. In chapter 4, Jesus takes on temptation, the temptation that always gets the better of you. And you know what? By the end of Matthew chapter 4, Jesus actually scores a winner over temptation. And you think, oh, this is interesting. This, this new player who has joined our team, he looks like he's the goods, right? He looks like he might be the one. He, he takes on the devil in that opening clash, and he gets the winner, and you think, oh, maybe, maybe he is the one. And, and then Jesus takes on sickness, and sickness always gets the better of you. But Jesus gets the better of it, and you think, oh, this, 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 new, this new player, I, I think he might be the one. And then he takes on the chaotic forces of nature, and he says to a storm, quiet, be still, and the storm is quiet, and you think, oh, wow. This is really interesting. And then he takes on evil, pure evil, and he drives demons out of people, and people are, he's even bigger than evil forces. And you see, Jesus goes throughout Matthew's gospel, and he, and he takes on our enemies in our name, on our behalf, as our champion. And it takes him all the way to the cross, where you know what's happening on the cross? He takes on even our sin, even our filth, even our judgment, even the fires that John has just been preaching about. He takes them all on himself on Good Friday on that cross. This is how much he wants to enter into your failure. He enters into the hell of the cross for you. And maybe if we were there on Good Friday, we would have thought, ah, oh, all is lost. The champion is dead. And then on Easter Sunday, what happens? The champion rises up again, and he scores the winner even over the final enemy, death. And he does that thing that footballers do. You know when footballers score, and they run to their home supporters, and they kind of tap their, their badge, and they're basically saying, it's for you, it's for you. You know, that's, that's, that's who Jesus is. He scores the winner over sin, death, and hell. He rises up again, and he says, it's for you, it's for you. I have entered into your darkness, now have my life. Right? I, I have entered into your failure. Now have my family. I keep on talking about this family. What do I mean by the family? Well, verse 16. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. That's the family. That's the family that you and I were made for. This is the family that both predated and produced the universe. There has always been a father loving his son, Jesus, in the joy of the Holy Spirit. There's always been this Niagara Falls of blessing, of life, 
of love. And Jesus comes to planet Earth and He is the one who is in on that Niagara Falls of blessing. And you know, you belong there too. You belong in this flow of love. You belong in this family of love. That's why when David's mother said those words, you're a hopeless case. You're a hopeless case. Do you know why such words pierce to the heart? Because you're meant to hear a, a parental verdict on your life that is so very different. You're meant to hear the eternal Father from heaven say, you are my son, you are my daughter, who I love, with you I am well pleased. You are made to hear that verdict. But you think, how do I get that verdict? I, I thought you said I was dark. I thought you said I was filthy. I thought you said I was a failure. Yeah, you are. And so am I. But do you want to come home? Do you want to come home to this family love? Do you want to hear a very different verdict on your life? Everything in your life has been aimed at getting this verdict. Every performance, every achievement, all the grades you're trying to get, all the money you're trying to earn, all the pride and the praise you're trying to get for yourself. You know what you're trying to get? You're trying to get the ultimate verdict on your life to say, you are loved. You are great. I'm well pleased with you. Your whole life is driven by that drum to hear that verdict. But if you don't hear the Father in heaven give you that verdict, you're going you're gonna to kill yourself trying to get it on your own terms. Don't kill yourself trying to get it on your own terms. Come home. It should, be, it should be obvious how you get this verdict. You know how you get this verdict on your life? You know how you get real change? First of all, you get real. And you say, I'm going to confess my sins. I'm going to say to God and the world, you know what, there is darkness out there, but there's a heck of a lot of darkness in here. I'm sorry. That's step one. And then step two is you say, Jesus, I want you. And if you belong to Jesus, you know what? You get his father as your father. You get his spirit as your spirit. You get his future as your future. So do you want Jesus? Do you want him? Let's bow our heads. Let's all bow our heads. And let me lead us in a prayer. Maybe you just want to call out to Jesus now and say, Jesus, I want you. I'm sorry for my darkness. I'm sorry for my sin. Thank you for your cross. Come into my life. You might want to call out to Jesus now. Father, there is darkness in our hearts, in our lives, and we are sorry. But we praise you for Jesus, your champion, your son, our strong elder brother. We thank you that he lived his life for us. We thank you that he died our death for us. And we thank you that he did it all for us. Help us to walk with Jesus through this life and into your eternity. Amen.